Welcome everyone. Glad to see you on my channel. Today I will tell you about an unusual story. An amazing story about companionship and love. I wish you a pleasant audience. Out of the way, tramp, shouted the smooth-shaven man at the wheel of an expensive car. There was obvious indignation in his voice, anger. Well, of course, some bum dared to skip in front of him on red, taking away his precious three seconds. The bum just waved, not even paying attention to the angry tone of a rich man speeding through town in a white foreign car. Bernard didn't like them. Arrogant, pompous, always in a hurry, always in a hurry, always angry. When you're homeless, time runs differently than it does with others. Bernard had been homeless all his life, and he had no intention of changing anything. For him, everything was very clear. Everything was very clear. Everything he needed to live, he already had. He had a small room in the local Schnabernard where the principal had taken him on as a janitor. Of course, it wasn't the same as living on the street, but Nikolai had something in common with the homeless. Lack of documents. Lack of documents. He never had any. However, he was doing just fine without them. The local library did not know a more well-read and enthusiastic man than he was. Even without knowing his last name, nevertheless, Bernard quoted famous philosophers, read everything related to psychology. He was excellent in geography and was good at solving examples. All who saw his skills, amazed. How could one be homeless with such talents and not even have a passport? It's my choice. It's how I live my life, replied the handsome skinny guy. Bernard was tall. His hungry childhood had taken its toll. He had grown up on the streets, and he could not get better. Even when he ate plenty, even when he ate plenty, he grew up with homeless people and with others. He hid from social services from the age of 13. Of course, they caught him periodically, but they could not hold him. He would run away instantly, taking with him anything that could be sold. Having escaped from the orphanage, Bernard was homeless for real. He sang sad songs in the square, collecting alms. A natural gift, a beautiful voice combined with perfect hearing. Those around him thought the boy was just earning a toy for himself. And the boy was earning a warm jacket, food and medicine for the homeless man Vita, who sheltered him. He grew up on the street, and it wasn't until he was 19 years old that he got a job at a school, where he has worked to this day. Bernard didn't know exactly when his birthday was, so he counted his years by the calendar. When New Year's Eve came around, he'd say, This year I'll be 28 years old. It didn't matter exactly when. He was not accustomed to holidays. Highly intelligent with good manners, he often went to the local second-hand shop. There he bought nice things, way and not new. Thus, he was mistaken for an ordinary man. However, the state was not aware of him. His job at the Sne brand was an outlet for him. The school was private, the principal, and the headmaster was a money-grubbing miser. It only pleased him that he could not pay taxes for an unofficial janitor. It went on like that for years. Bernard worked in the Schnecker, and sometimes when he wanted to earn money, he would go out into the square and sing beautiful, pitiful songs. And all his free time he devoted to reading. He never went to Spernard. While he lived in the homeless shelter where he grew up since his birth, there was no craving for knowledge. He was beaten and abused by the other kids, so he actually ran away from there every time. And there was just no one there to clean it up. Who cares about children's squabbles? And these were not children's quarrels. Angry and bitter, the elders of the orphanage forced the children to do everything they said, and the rebellious ones were beaten in the ribs with all their might, threatening to kill them if they showed bruises to the educators. Bernard could take no more humiliation, so he ran away. He saw how those who were slightly older were first the victims, and then after that they too became bloodthirsty and beat the little ones, just to get even for their unhappy childhoods. It was a real hazing like in the army, only with little kids involved, and the adults just didn't know about it. Thinking back to his childhood, Bernard felt uneasy every time. 
He knew in his mind that he would never see those kids again. All of them in their 30s, probably in jail or dead from an overdose in a back alley somewhere. Bernard saw no prospect for them, knowing that such bitterness would keep them from blending into society. He ran away from the orphanage not only to stop the beatings and bullying, but also to avoid becoming like them, to avoid becoming embittered. When he was in his early 20s, Bernard felt a craving for knowledge. The school library was full of books, and Bernard could smile so charmingly that women's hearts melted before his smile. Thus, the local librarian was in love with him, although she was over 50. She would give him any books, writing them down for herself. After all, Bernard could not be listed as a student, and only students and teachers were allowed to lend books there. Bernard hurried home that day because he had heard on the radio he had found at the junkyard and repaired that the temperature was expected to rise. The road went through a park. The sun was blazing mercilessly, the heat driving the town's residents crazy for the third month. August was slowly creeping towards September. Bernard was hot. But was that a reason to shave? He'd grown a lot of hair over the summer. His razor had dulled and there was no money to buy a new one. Bernard had spent all his money on new clothes and food. He could not sing in the heat. He would faint if he was exposed to the sun for more than an hour. A fragile body, his health undermined from the start. Already at the exit from the park, closer to the promenade, Bernard noticed a beautiful young girl. She looked about 20 years old, dressed in gypsy clothes. She was pestering people with a cheeky smile that never left her face. She offered to give fortune, telling to everyone for money. Some said yes, others told them to go to hell. Bernard was interested because he had long been accustomed to people's aggression. He had performed on the street himself. He was chased away a million times, threatened with being turned into the police. But that didn't dampen his spirits one bit. Since the day the homeless man Victor heard the boy sing, Bernard had learned more than a hundred songs. The people around him thought he was in a musical's genre. No one suspected that the boy lived in a basement with three bums, a dog, and a dozen rats. Would you read my fortune? He asked, approaching the young gypsy. Certainly, but not for free. She smiled slyly. The girl had Slava features, white skin, only her hair, black as pitch. Bernard thought it must have been dyed. She hardly looked like a gypsy. Passers-by were not hard to fool. All they needed was bling and attire. He looked deeper. I'll pay you if you're a real gypsy. He smiled. Bernard had lied to passers-by many times. To one, he might tell them he was collecting money for his mother's surgery. To another, he'd run away from his drinking father to make a living. A third, that he lived with a large family and sang on the street to buy candy for his brothers and sisters. He could easily come up with any legend, dozens in a day, and never once repeated himself. Making up stories was even enjoyable because he never had a real family. At least in his stories, he managed to feel ordinary. A child with a mother and father, brothers and sisters. It's not about ethnicity, racist. I'm not a gypsy, but I guess, better than most. I have a natural gift from my grandmother, and she loved a Russian, gave birth to my father. My father married a Russian too, and the gift came to me. The pretty girl was fast. Are you an orphan too? He asked. The girl looked at the boy in surprise. How do you know? I also earn money on the square sometimes. And I also make up all kinds of stories. If passers-by ask about me before they pay up. I didn't end up in an orphanage until I was 17. My grandmother died. I didn't know my parents. My father left me. My mother died in childbirth. My grandmother raised me. And she's a gypsy. Listen. Either don't interfere or get a golden handle. You're so nosy, she pouted funny. Bernard was surprised. Even with a beard overgrown and sweaty, he could arouse interest in girls. She hadn't just been spouting off at him for no reason. 
He thought she liked him. And he actually liked her, too. So he took out his last hundred dollars from his pocket. That's all I have on me. Sorry, I left my card and my suitcase of money at home. Didn't think they'd come in handy. He smiled slyly. The girl took the hundred dollar bill, quickly tucked it into the waistband of her dress, and began to look at his hand. She stared for a long time, as if she were really studying it. The girl became serious. Bernard thought it was part of the show. She was a good actress. He even wondered what she would tell him. Would she find out he was homeless? Would she realize that he'd never had a lasting relationship or family? I don't know what it means, but there are very rare signs on your hand. I haven't seen them before. I'll just talk and you listen, she said, glimpsing a worried glance at Bernard. Your palm is telling me that half of you is dead. You're half... Part of you is dead, and you're all alone. You have a gift, too. But I don't see what it is you are gifted. Bernard sighed. Which half of me is dead? The upper half or the lower half? He asked, grinning. Don't laugh. I'm telling you the truth. No one else will tell you that. I am sorry. But you said it about me. I already know about me. Is there anything about my future that I can know? The girl looked again into the palm of her hand. You are at a turning point. Soon your life will be different. Everything will change for you. You turned off your path when you were very young. Something happened then, and you weren't living the way you were supposed to all along. And you've been alone forever. But soon that will change. Your life will get back on track and you'll be happy. But to do that, you have to be brave. Otherwise, you'll be alone all your life. The smile slid off Bernard's face. Some of what she said was true. Was it a coincidence? Thank you, he smiled. He walked away without saying a word, only turning back to the girl who had told him something he was trying not to think about. Darling, he thought. The Dario truth in her words was undoubtedly there. But what does that mean? Half of you is dead. Is this about his parents? So they were dead, and he didn't live the life he was meant to live because of that? Or was he not living his destiny because he ran away from the orphanage? Maybe he would have been adopted. But he knew for a fact that he'd been born frail, and his mother had abandoned him, and there were no other relatives. Bernard shook his head. Oh, forget her, that fortune teller. It was all nonsense. He ran across the road as usual through a red light. Fortunately, there were no cars on this street. Soon he was in the scourd, nodding to the security guard at the entrance, Bernarding to the security guard at the entrance. Bernard walked behind the big, beautiful building into the tiny back room, only 20 square feet. This was his home. There was a staff shower room in the school building, Bernard bathed there, but only in the evenings, so that the grand, pompous teaching staff would not know about it. None of them would bathe with the janitor, especially if they found out that he... Tramp. The next morning, Bernard walked through that park again and saw the gypsy woman there again. This time, there was a whole line to her. People learned the girl was good at fortune telling and told their acquaintances who rushed to her. She did not charge much. She was cheaper than other fortune tellers, whose advertisements were in every newspaper and on every newspaper and on every poll. Bernard went up to her, too. When the crowd dispersed, the girl saw him. Are you here again? She smiled. Good to see me. He thought, if I shave, she'll be speechless. I missed you. Is there anything else you can tell me about my future? The girl jammed her fists into her sides. Did you bring your card and your suitcase of money? Bernard laughed. No, as luck would have it, I forgot them at home, in his huge mansion. He was going to sing in the square to buy razors and foam and get himself cleaned up, but instead he spent the whole day by her side. The stubborn beauty didn't even give her name. But she was flirting with him, too. 
Bernard decided to show his charm and help the girl earn money. Throughout the day, he was enticing people, praising the gypsy's talents. To some, he said she was, his wife to others, that she was his bride. To others, that the girl was his daughter. He helped convince people of her honesty and talent, persuading passersby not to be stingy. Toward evening, the heat made him feel unwell, but Bernard had no intention of leaving. However, the gypsy woman noticed his condition. Are you not feeling well? What is the matter? She asked. You were well this morning. Bernard was embarrassed. He could not tell her he was hungry and would faint at any moment from the heat, like a young lady from a bygone age. It's all right, beautiful. Don't make it up. You play well, of course, but about your superpowers you obviously lie. And I don't mind. I can lie in public so that God himself will believe it. But you can't fool me. The girl pressed her lips together in displeasure. You can hardly stand on your feet. Sit down on the bench. I'll be right there. She said and went away. Bernard sat down and was relieved. He didn't want to leave her at all. And the singing on the avenue could have waited. What was the point of being a bum if you couldn't miss a day's work by courting a hottie? Soon, the girl approached him with two hot dogs and two bottles of mineral water. They ate and fed the ubiquitous pigeons that seemed to have forgotten how to fly, and all they did was walk around begging for food from park visitors. I sometimes forget to eat. I don't need much food, she said. Why don't you tell me your name? He asked. The gypsy woman threw a long look at the boy. Handsome young, not well-groomed, clearly not married. Why not tell her? After all, he'd helped her earn almost twice as much today. Agatha, what about you? Bernard. Water and food made him feel better. The day was drawing to a close. I had to get her number or find some other way to contact her. If you're done for the day, I'll walk you out, he said. No, I won't show you where I live. Who knows if you're a maniac? Look at my hand and tell me who I am. You're a fortune teller, he retorted. The girl took his palm again and immediately became serious. Bernard was beginning to think she really knew something. In any case, when she guessed people, she could unmistakably tell who was married, who had family problems, who had lost loved ones, who had lost loved ones. Bernard did not believe in mysticism, did not believe in God. But this girl clearly knew some tricks. It was more a knowledge of psychology and observation, he thought. You're an orphan and homeless, she said suddenly. Bernard stopped smiling and jerked his hand away. What? I didn't see it yesterday. You're all alone. You have no one and nothing. But that's about to change. Bernard didn't know what to say, how to react. He was silent for a long time. You figured it out because I'm unshaven and I've been sitting here with you all day. Right? Explain, he asked. This girl was shattering his established stereotypes, and he didn't want that. Bernard, I saw it on my hand. It's called chiromancy. But I didn't learn it from books. I learned it from my grandmother. She drew the signs for me herself and showed me how to see them on the palms of my hands. She was a gypsy, I told you. Well, I guess I'll be going. Bernard was about to leave the girl when she caught up with him. Wait, I'll come with you. I'll walk you out. I think I scared you. But you can't be so skeptical. There's so much unexplored, unknowable in the world. Can't you suppose for a moment that I really am a palm reader and that I can give fairly accurate predictions? Bernard felt a little calmer. She knew he was homeless, but she didn't turn her back on him. Walking beside him, I don't believe in fortune-telling. It's just a way to make money. And for the rest of us, a way to help people like us make money. Do you want me to read your fortune? He offered. The girl held out her hand to him. Bernard took it. When he touched her hand, he felt an attraction. She was the first girl who didn't run away when she found out he was a tramp. 
I see that you have two legs. The lines on your palm tell me you're a woman, and you definitely have a nose, he said jokingly. Then Bernard rolled his eyes and gave out another batch of predictions. The spirits contacted me and said you have five fingers on each hand and foot, and you've never been to outer space. They also said you'll have a Tuesday tomorrow. She laughed out loud. Bernard burst into laughter too. It was getting darker and cooler. They were standing at the gate of the fancy school building behind where Bernard lived. We are here, he said quietly. Do you live here? Agatha asked. Yeah. It's my private palace, Bernard bragged. And why does it say welcome on the door? She nodded at the inscription on the school door. I'm hospitable, he shrugged. Bernard leaned slowly toward her and kissed her. The pretty girl didn't mind at all. How can I find you? Why don't you give me your number? He asked. Nope. I'll be in the same place. You'll feel how to find me. And if it's not destiny, there's nothing to find. Trust fate for once in your life, skeptic. Bernard was glad she knew the word skeptic at such a young age. So she's not stupid. Probably even read something. He went behind the school, went into his room. He wanted to lie down on the bed, tiredness taking its toll. But his body demanded water, and Bernard, taking a towel and clean clothes, went to the school building to bathe. He knocked quietly on the door with a tentative knock. The guard napping inside opened it without question, and Bernard enjoyed a nice cool shower, feeling utterly relieved. Tomorrow I'm going to sing in the square and buy myself a razor and get that Bernard's hair out of my face and kiss her for real without being embarrassed about my unshavenness. He thought, falling asleep. The next morning he woke up at dawn. He took a long time getting dressed up, picking out an outfit. He wasn't clairvoyant, but he knew Agatha would be waiting for him in the park. For the first time in his life, he had something real, something mutual, something that warmed his soul and that he was painfully afraid of losing. Bernard walked down the street, dancing, humming, and escorting old ladies across the street. It was a beautiful day. Now he would meet her. The road went through the private sector. As he passed one of the cottages, Bernard noticed the smoke. Gawkers had already gathered around. Smoke was coming from the window. There was clearly a fire. Did you call the fire brigade? Bernard asked. Everyone was silent. Is anyone in the house? Is everyone out? No one was hurt? He asked. People began to disperse. It became clear that they were just passers-by onlookers. They weren't even going to help. Bernard realized that he was the only sane one in that crowd. He tried to open the gate of the gate that led to the private courtyard, but it was locked. A code had to be entered. The houses were 300 years old, and they put locks on them. He cursed and climbed through the gate. He ran up to the house, went inside. It was open. There was an old granny lying on the floor, and a boy about five years old was standing over her, crying. Hi, buddy. Look what smoke you have. Come on, let's get out of here. I'll take your grandmother out. She'll be fine. Don't worry. Let's go outside. Bernard was careful not to frighten the child, so he wouldn't have to be fished out of the burning house as well. He didn't see much of a fire, though. A curtain and part of the baguette over the kitchen stove were on fire. Daddy, you're back. You have come to save us. The boy shouted as he saw Bernard's face. You've been inhaling too, I see. Come quick. Bernard picked up the old woman in his arms and left the house, coughing up smoke. The child hurried after him. When everyone was outside, several other concerned neighbors gathered in the courtyard. They began to call an ambulance. Bernard put the grandmother on the bench in the yard and rushed into the house. The kid flew after him. Stay right there. I'll be right there. I'll put out the fire. I'm coming with you, he shouted. Take the baby away. I'll put it out. There's only a curtain burning. Bernard shouted to the neighbors. A pretty blonde woman in a bathrobe immediately took care of the boy, 
who was rushing to Bernard, and for some reason called him father, and he went inside. He quickly tore the curtain from the window and began stomping on it. The baguette was still smouldering, and Bernard had to pour water on it, which he had poured into a cup. When the fire was out, he opened the windows to let the smoke out. Somewhere, an ambulance or fire truck was already squealing. Who could tell? Bernard suddenly remembered he was in a hurry to see Agatha, and now he just couldn't go to her like he'd planned. Nor could he sing in the square, collecting alms. Dressed like that, he looked around for a mirror to assess the scale of the disaster. On one of the walls he saw a portrait in a black frame. It caught his attention. Bernard stepped closer. What the hell was that? In the portrait was him, his face. Exactly, only with a neat haircut and a tie. It was him, not the man who looked like him, but him. Bernard thought he too had inhaled smoke, shook his head, looked again. Again he cursed in surprise. Footsteps were heard behind him. One of the neighbors came in to see what the stranger was doing and whether the fire had been managed. Bernard came out. Outside, a boy clung to him. The same little boy. Where have you been for so long? asked the little boy. Bernard realized that the kid had mistaken him for the man on the wall. The resemblance was striking. Somewhere on a bench, a grandmother was regaining consciousness. How are you feeling? Bernard asked, stepping closer. He is the one who dragged you out of the house in his arms. Timofeyevna. This guy. The grandmother looked intently into the guy's face and fainted again. What is it? Bernard was beginning to realize that something was wrong here, and there was no one to ask again. But in all the hustle and bustle, not even the neighbors could be bothered to ask. Just then, the doctors came in. They took the old woman to the hospital, and they took the boy with them. Will you come with us, Daddy? The boy asked, climbing into the ambulance. Some of the neighbors crossed themselves, noticing Bernard's striking resemblance to the man in the portrait. Get in, if you're related, the doctor suggested. Bernard realized he couldn't just walk away. He climbed into the car, and it drove to the hospital. An hour later, Bernard was examined by doctors. However, when they asked for papers, he stated that they had just tragically burned in a fire. Luckily, he heard the boy call his last name Plotnikov. If he calls him Papa, he might as well be Plotnikov. Bernard Plotnikov. Bernard said to the nurse. The boy corrected him, Carl, not Bernard. The nurse looked up in surprise. Bernard stood up, smiled embarrassedly, and nodded, backing toward the door. I'm sorry, I don't feel well. Where is your bathroom? The nurse quickly pointed out how to get to the bathroom, and Bernard, feigning gagging, ran outside. There he quickly ran into the office where the old woman was being taken. The doctor had already left her. The woman was lying on the bed with her eyes closed. Shaking his head, Bernard entered and closed the door behind him. I'm sorry, he began. The older woman opened her eyes. Bernard realized she couldn't see very well. He sat down next to her on the bed so she could see his face. It was me who pulled you out of the fire. My name is Bernard. I have only one question for you. There is a photograph on your wall. The man in it looks a lot like me. Who is he? The woman looked at the man's face and clutched at her heart. I, uh, Bernard. My name is Bernard. I'm not the one in the picture. But somehow I look a lot like him. Maybe you know something about it. I'm an orphan myself. After this phrase, the old woman's face froze. She looked up at him, squinted to see. Her eyes were pale blue, her hair disheveled. Bernard thought that if he saw her at night looking like that, he'd be creeped out. How old are you? She said with trembling lips. I'm 28. No, you're 29. Carl would have been 29 years old. Today, who is Carl? Bernard asked, trying to find out the truth. He is my son. He's dead. 
and you are his twin brother. I gave birth to twins, but my parents told me that the second boy was born with Isaiah Gate. Bernard suddenly remembered everything he knew about himself from the orphanage workers. His legs were twisted and he was very small, and the doctors didn't believe the second boy would survive. So you gave him up, said Bernard, beginning to understand what was happening. At that moment, a nurse entered the room. What are you doing here? She needs rest. Visits afterwards. Bernard resisted, and so did the old woman on the bed. But they pushed him out of the room. I'll wait here. I need to talk to this woman. He stubbornly sat by the ward and waited there for hours on end. He saw that a neighbor with white hair had come to pick up the boy and told the doctor that he would stay with her for the time being. The boy kept asking about his daddy, and Bernard sat around the corner and wouldn't come out. He had already guessed what was going on, but he had to find out for sure. He couldn't think of anything, and even Agatha was out of his mind. The shock was so bad. Deep down, he was afraid it wouldn't be true. Even as a child, Bernard had forbidden himself to dream of having a family. When he ran away from the orphanage for the fifth and very last time, he realized that the road to a family was closed for him. At first he consoled himself with the idea that the homeless people were his real family. They took care of him. From them Bernard learned about politics, about how unjust power was. He well remembered how they resented the level of salaries. Those who sit in the government have salaries, hundreds of thousands, or even more while ordinary workers had two or three tens. In the capital, of course, they are paid more. But all the jobs in the countryside have been cut. People have nowhere to work, nothing to eat. And they are forced to leave their homes and go to the city. And those who stubbornly stayed got $100 or even less. Is that fair? Bernard was in transition at the time and took the words of his breadwinners very poignantly. He decided that he didn't need anything from the state and he would be free to live. No paperwork to be found. No deductions to brazen bureaucrats from his honestly earned money. One of the homeless men had papers and a pension. According to him, the state had left him out. They couldn't find some paperwork, didn't have some points, and for 35 jobs in the same place he was given a pension of $200. What could it be enough for? His health didn't allow him to work. He moved down to the basement from his rented apartment and spent the money only on food, clothes, and a bathhouse. He went there every Saturday so he wouldn't look too dirty. Bernard lived with these men for a long time, over two years. Then one of them died. The one who loved him died, the one who loved him best and considered him his own grandson. And Bernard forbade making any more friends or even thinking about family. It was a terrible blow for a teenage boy with a hard life to lose the first person he had ever been attached to. He had lived alone for many years without getting attached. Relationships with girls were short. They began as soon as Bernard got a job at school and began to clean up his act. He realized then that he was quite good looking. He was naturally good with his tongue. That was enough. But as soon as he felt he was starting to get attached, he confessed to the girls that he was a bum and didn't even have a passport. He had been missing for years, but there was no one to look for him. And as soon as he said this, the girls ran away, not wanting to get involved with a bum. And now, now that he had just met someone who wasn't afraid of his lifestyle, it turned out that he might have had a twin brother, or just a very similar brother. Or it was just a simple coincidence. As evening began to fall, the doctors glimpsed less frequently in the corridor. Bernard slipped quietly into the room. The old woman immediately looked up. And I thought you had gone away. Come here, Bernard. I want to look at you. The woman obviously had very poor eyesight. How can she handle a boy all by herself? I'm right here. Bernard sank down on the bed beside her and looked into her cloudy eyes. Something tingled inside. It was scary to experience it, but it felt so good. You look so much like Carl. The same voice and the same eyes. 
You're exactly the same. I made inquiries. I wanted to take you away. Only my mother paid the Nagatheka Nagathika to tell me if I came for the second child that he was dead. And she did. And I thought so for years until my mother got sick. Before she died, she told me everything. She confessed. But it was too late to look for you. You were already of age. Tell me, how did this happen? Where was my father? I fell in love with a boy when I was young, but he was poor. And my father was very strict. He was often away on business trips. My mother strictly forbade me to see him, and my father threatened me. But I ran to him anyway. I told my mother straight out that I'd be with him. That was it. The day he wanted to take me back to his place, my father arrived. He beat me and him half to death and took me to a monastery. I was 16 years old. He threw me, covered in bruises and blood, on the porch at the feet of a nun and told me that if I escaped, he would find me and kill me. The nuns took me in and I became a novice. I lived there until I was 35, in faith, in prayer, and in sorrow. I heard rumors that my beloved had married and had three children. At 35, I saw him again. He came to me to say goodbye. Doctors had given him a terrible diagnosis. It didn't take long for him to die. He was an electrician, received a powerful electric shock, barely survived. His heart had been failing ever since. It got worse and worse. Doctors forbade him to do anything, even walk up and down stairs. There were fainting spells, seizures. He came to me, afraid he was dying, and we spent one night together. Unforgettable. After that, I had to leave the convent because I realized I was pregnant. I came to my doorstep with a belly. My mother didn't visit me for a long time. They had changed their phone number and I couldn't contact them, so I just came to them with my thing. My mother opened the door in a black dress. They had buried my father the day before. He had been hit by a car. Everything happened instantly. Here he was going to the store to get bread, and then he was gone. Everybody died in that accident. Three random bystanders, the driver and the passenger. The drivers were some daredevils, young, drunk, my mother accepted me, but she was also very strict. When we found out that I was having twins, she immediately wanted me to keep one child in an orphanage. I refused, and she kept quiet. But when you were born, weak and with crooked legs, she began to insist. In the end, she said that she wouldn't let me in the house with a handicapped child, that we wouldn't be able to live together because there were only two of us, her and me. What about my father? But what? Is he dead? Bernard asked. No, he is still alive to this day. What will happen to him? Men tend to exaggerate everything. He had an operation, and things got better somehow. I went to him with Carl in my arms, but he's got a family. Three kids. He said he'd give me money if I needed it. Umariel didn't tell his wife offered to be his mistress, and that wasn't what I was expecting at all. Of course, I was stupid as hell. I just left without taking anything from him, and I started raising Carl on my own. Mom was gone. I found out you were alive all these years, and Carl went to serve his country, and he went under contract first to one hot spot, then to another. He had a girlfriend as a civilian. Her name was Nina. They had already applied to the registry office, and the wedding was two weeks away when the news came that Carl had been killed. Tears welled up in the old woman's eyes, and she sighed intermittently. Bernard took her hand. What was he like? My brother? Carl was wonderful. He had an ear for music. He sang so well in the Sabernard. But he refused music school. I was even offered free lessons with him by his teachers because he was unique. Perfect ear, sang like he'd been learning it since he was in diapers. But he didn't want to. He was an excellent student, inquisitive, and very patriotic. 
Oh, how I miss his songs. He always sang me a song from a movie. What was it? About homeless teenagers. Bernard knew right away what song he was talking about. I started life in the slums of the city, and I heard no kind words. When you caressed your children, I begged for food. I froze. Bernard sang that song perfectly, quietly, and there were tears running down his cheeks because there was truth in it, in every line. His elderly mother was crying too. So did the nurse who came over to hear who was singing in the hospital that evening. When Bernard finished that song and wiped away his tears, his mother hugged him when she saw the nurse behind him. That's my son. That's my son. I haven't seen him since he was born, can you imagine? And he saved me from the fire and I found him. I found him. The nurse let Bernard stay there for a while, but when it got dark, he had to leave. He promised he would come back tomorrow, and he wrote his phone number on a piece of paper to his mother. Bernard had a cell phone. An old one he bought offhand. He rarely used it, but he charged it so he could watch the news on the internet and download audiobooks. He listened to them while he swept the yard at Bernard's. Bernard walked down the street home and thought about everything he had heard today. It was so strange and nice to know that he had a mother. It was just unbelievable. Mom. She gave birth to him late at 35, and how cruel her father, his grandfather, was to her. He just didn't like the young man, and he not only forbade her to see him, but he beat her and sent her to a convent. And what a meanness his grandmother had done. It was because of her that he spent his life as a vagabond. Because of her. Bernard realized that he knew nothing about himself or his mother. All he found out was that his birthday was yesterday, August 21. And I, it turns out, am a Leo. He said aloud. Without noticing it, he walked across town to the school gate. And I... Libra, said the guard who was smoking nearby. Well done. Good sign of the Zodiac. Bernard patted the fat man on the shoulder good-naturedly and went to bed. In the morning he realized he had to find Agatha. She had to find Agatha. She had foretold him the change and it had happened. He must tell her. Besides, she must have been waiting for him yesterday, and he never showed up. There was no time to sing on the avenue and make a little money again. Bernard reborrowed a few hundred from the guard, bought a razor, and tidied himself up. Now he had to find Agatha quickly and hurry to his mother. How wild that word sounded to him. Mother. Even in his mind he stumbled over it, trying to call her it trying to call her something else. That woman, sweet old lady. That boy's grandmother. But the point didn't change. She was his mother. Bernard was sure he looked good. He hurried to the avenue but didn't see Agatha there. He waited about half an hour. It was getting hot. Ask, have you seen a fortune teller around here? Not tall, with a long braid. Bernard said to the ice cream lady, She was here yesterday. She was sitting here on the bench till dark, waiting for someone. And today she's gone. Bernard sighed heavily. It can't be helped. She would come back tomorrow. Today it was necessary to hurry to her. Entering the room, he was taken aback. The bed was empty, no belongings, no belongings, no bed inside. Where was the woman in the room? Bernard asked a passing doctor. She passed away yesterday. We have informed the family. They should be coming to get her things soon. Hearing this, his eyes darkened. No, God can't joke with him like that. He had only found his mother yesterday. Only yesterday, the little boy inside him touched his mother for the first time. He had just recognized her, was beginning to recognize her. Bernard was not feeling well. Everything was spinning around him. Suddenly, a familiar female voice rang out behind him. Bernard, are you there? He turned around. Behind him stood his mother, smiling. She was more chipper today. Apparently, she had just showered. Her hair was in a bun, still wet. Mama. He threw his arms around her. You what? Wrong room. 
Carl was like that too. He couldn't remember the numbers of the wards in the hospital or the location of the classrooms in the Sternard. They went to the room together. Bernard felt better. But he was dizzy afterwards all day. He spent at least five hours with his mother. The doctor promised that he would discharge her tomorrow. Her tests were normal. They talked about everything. Mother told him that she had been paid a large sum of money after Carl's death. It was still lying in the account, untouched. She had enough on her pension. She was going to have an eye operation, but there was no way. There was no one to leave the boy with. There was a possibility that after the operation, she would be completely blind. Then the child would most likely be taken away, and she herself would be sent to a nursing home. She couldn't leave Chad, her grandson, in that position. You shouldn't have run away, Bernard. The state was supposed to give you an apartment as an orphan, and you disappeared. Did you know that? Bernard scratched his head. They told me, but I was living with the homeless at the time, and I was scared to go back. I'd run away. I was afraid I'd be punished for it. And anyway, I didn't want to be part of this country, Mom. The woman looked up in surprise. Yeah, I guess my brother and I weren't as much alike as you say. I've hated all that politics since I was young, all those bribers that sit in every institution today. There is no justice there. Those in power cut pensions. People work all their lives, and in their old age they live on pennies that they don't even have enough to buy a place to live. Everything is bought, Mom. I don't want to be part of it all, the woman smiled. It's the system, son. It's not perfect, but even it has some merit. And Carl was of the same opinion as you. You should have seen him at all those rallies. He was a hell of a people's rights man, and he went to war for his country, for me, for his son. Wait, where's his mother? You said there was some way. Where's his mom? You said some Nina? She had a baby and gave it to me. She wrote a waiver. After Carl died, her parents were rich but stingy, and they made her give up the baby. They wouldn't even let her breastfeed. She was a photo model. They sent her to live in America. They said she's not coming back here and that I shouldn't bother them. Or they'll send the baby, their own grandchild, to an orphanage. But you got custody. Carl did his best. It also helped that he signed a contract. The government is more willing to help the military. You're right, a lot of things aren't fair. But if the system didn't exist, there wouldn't be any more justice. People by nature are greedy, selfish. They don't want justice. They want profit. How you are like him, after all. They didn't just talk about political views. Mother told Bernard about herself, about her life, about what his father, whom she had loved all her life, had been like. She asked Bernard to apply for papers and said she wanted him to get his things tomorrow and move into her house so that by the time she was discharged, they would all be together. Chad will be glad. The boy is so homesick for his father. In the evening, Bernard came home with the thought that tomorrow he would have a family. It meant so much to him. At night, it was like chewing gum. Bernard couldn't sleep, but no longer from the heat that August was lavishing on him, but rather from his thoughts. Everything seemed to be happening to someone else, not to him. He no longer hoped to recognize his mother's care. But it was also unsettling that for a few seconds today he felt what it meant to lose his mother. When the doctor informed him that the ward patient had died yesterday, the ground really slipped from under his feet. Now he thought about it. There would come a time when she would be gone, and then he would feel it again, and that's it. The downside of attachment. No matter how much you love another person, you have to lose them one day. Either you lose him or he loses you. Before, Bernard had nothing to worry about. He didn't love anyone, and neither did he. But now there was fear. And with it, a great happiness that squeezed his chest and made him want to smile, even in his sleep. The next few days 
were quite eventful. Bernard moved his things, which, by the way, fit in one big bag from the supermarket, to his mother's house. That same day, little Chad was picked up from a neighbor's house. Bernard explained to the boy who he was, told the whole story from beginning to end. The boy nodded, but it was clear. In the man with his father's face, Chad would see his father, not his uncle. Maybe it was for the best, because that night his mother, who had arrived from the hospital, had asked him at dinner to get custody for herself. Who's going to give me custody? I'm homeless, Bernard objected. You are my lost son, and the rest is not their concern. We'll do the paperwork for you like we're supposed to. We'll say that you were taken abroad as a slave, as a young boy, but you escaped many years later. Russian bureaucrats watch soap operas too, and they will be happy to help you. The older woman smiled slyly. Bernard only now began to see his features in her. He realized that she had given him beauty. Even at her 62 years old, Lilia Alexandrovna was quite good looking. He watched her. How she eats, how she talks, how she gestures. Never took his eyes off her. He wanted to look at her for all the years she had been away. And now he knew it wasn't her fault. She had nowhere else to go. She'd been cheated, even when she'd wanted him back from the orphanage. But now life had put everything in its place. Bernard suddenly remembered what Agatha had told him about this, that he had turned from his path when he was a child, but that he would soon be back on it. Agatha, we have to find her. For the next two weeks, Bernard spent the next two weeks doing paperwork, running around and stalking Agatha. Locals said she wasn't in the park. Someone had seen her in the square, on the avenue, but Bernard couldn't find her. He was beginning to worry. Was he going to lose her? She had said, if it's not our destiny to be together, there's no reason to exchange phone numbers. But fate had nothing to do with it. Bernard hadn't come to see her that day for a very good reason. He was rescuing people from the fire. I was reunited with my family after 29 years of orphanhood. In terms of paperwork, everything went well. The story Bernard's mother made up went great. Everyone got into it and made an effort to get it done sooner rather than later. Since Bernard was under 30, he could still qualify for an apartment, so they put him on the waiting list first. Then he put him on the waiting list first. Then began the process of adopting his playmate. It was very difficult. You had to go through doctors, take certificates, which were hard to get because Bernard was not in the general databases. He had endured so much bureaucracy and paperwork in those two weeks that he regretted his decision to remain. Homeless years earlier. However, the ice had broken, and he now felt like a full-fledged member of the society he had once despised. But that was only because he had been mistreated in the shelter, because no one stood up for him. No one gave him a hand in a difficult moment, of which there were many. And the opinion of the homeless people, the only people who were around, also had an effect. Now he saw things differently. Yes, there was injustice and corruption and all this bureaucratic execution, but this made him a man. This joined him to the others. It provided reassurance. Now there was no fear of getting sick, and he could walk through any door of any building. Looking for Agatha, Bernard wandered into the neighborhood where the orphanage used to be. He remembered where he'd escaped from, so he decided to walk to the place. The old building stood out of sight, overgrown, unimproved. He walked closer. A castle. What had happened? Bernard turned to a passerby who apparently lived nearby. The man looked about fifty years old. The orphanage is long gone. More than ten years ago, a terrible thing happened here. Several children were tortured. The teachers were put in jail and so was the management. There was such a scandal. Aren't you from around here? Haven't you heard about it on the news? The kids were beating each other up, bullying each other. And when the tragedy happened, they shut everything down. The building had been empty for years. Bernard listened to this and stayed looking at the dilapidated shelter that was closed. What would have happened to him if he hadn't run away? 
Chasing the fearful thoughts away, he staggered home. The habit of walking remained. He did not even think of using transport. At home, my mother was waiting and worried. I was about to call the police. Where were you? I was so worried. Bernard smiled and hugged her. Chad joined them. How nice it was to feel that someone cared about you. A few more days passed. Bernard returned from the square, where he had waited for hours on end for Agatha. He put up notices where he wrote his phone number and asked the gypsy Agatha to call him. Still looking for that girl. Get ready. Let's take a walk. They went outside. It was evening, the sound of bells ringing not far away. The sound seemed to clear the air around them of all evil, and even their thoughts became clearer in those moments. After walking a few houses, they turned and entered an entranceway. They went up to the third floor and rang the bell. Who are we here to see, Mom? Bernard asked. This is where your father lives. I've never done anything for you in this life. It's time to make up for it. There's not much time left. My feelings and my pride don't matter. He will help you find Agatha. A young girl answered the door. Are you here to see Charles? Come in. They walked into a small, cozy apartment and entered a room that was isolated. There was an older man sitting in a wheelchair. Lilia? He was surprised, smiling. Lilia? Answered a woman with gray hair. They hugged and kissed. Just do not faint, Sergei, she said, handing the man glasses from the nightstand. He put them on and grabbed his heart. How could it be, Carl? I saw your body. How could you? He started wheezing. Quiet. Be quiet. It's not Carl. It's Bernard. There were two children. I told you. I found him. Or rather, he found him. It's a long story. A long story. I had to tell. Turns out, Lily brought her son to his biological father. He used to have connections in the police force, so she decided to ask him to find Agatha. Charles promised he'd do it the very next morning. All this time, Lily and Charles had been living on the same street. They saw each other on the street, but they didn't even say hello. Charles's wife was very jealous. She bore him three sons and somehow found out that he had a girlfriend on the side and that they had children. Throughout her life, Lily never even spoke to her, and not long ago she died. Charles had fallen, injured his hip, and now lived in a wheelchair. None of the sons he had raised wanted to take him in, and now they were preparing to send him to a nursing home. When Lily's father beat him and his beloved and sent her to a monastery, he waited five years for her. He came to the walls of the convent, but the nuns were strict and would not let him in not allowing her to see him either. After that, he married the first woman who was interested in him and swore to be faithful to her. But when doctors falsely diagnosed him, telling him he would die very soon, Charles went to see Lily, and from that visit, children were born. Twins, his wife, however, was the daughter of an influential man, an official, and she knocked out some incredible surgery on him. Charles made a full recovery, and to this day, there have been no serious heart problems. Only overweight and a hip injury, which takes a very long time to heal at his age, have marred his existence. Well, and also the fact that his children rejected him and don't want to mess with him. Charles was at Carl's funeral. He had no contact with his son, and Lily had never told the boy that the man next door was his own father. Carl died without knowing the truth, but Bernard did. You don't have to go to a nursing home. Maybe he could stay with us, Lily suggested, looking at his son questioningly. That's for you to decide. It's your house. It's ours. You're registered there now. And you're going to have to take care of some of the things. Would you agree to live with your father and mother for a while? She asked him. Tears came to her eyes. It couldn't have been a greater gift of fate. If you don't mind, Dad... Bernard said to the old man, who also burst into tears, 
Having settled everything the next day, Charles moved in with Lily. He confessed to her that he had loved her all his life, but that he could no longer betray his family. He didn't dare. He had held high office all his life, not without the help of his wife's influential father. He was afraid of losing not only his favor or his job. His family was at stake, his wife and three sons. He did not dare to leave, and he acted like a coward. Lily said she didn't hold a grudge, and Bernard didn't know him to hold a grudge at all. The house became noisy and cheerful. Charles turned out to be a pleasant man in every way. Lily helped him get up, and he began to get around with crutches. Chad was happy to have not only his own uncle, but also his grandfather in the house. And Bernard was just happy, afraid he was dreaming it all. And there was only one detail missing to make him completely happy. A few days went by and his phone rang. Bernard picked up the phone. Hello, you asked me to call. I'm ringing now. Came over the other end of the line. At that moment, the last stone was lifted from the handsome, thin guy's soul. Bernard exhaled. I just wanted to tell you that your predictions came true. You wouldn't believe what happened to me. By the way, I didn't intentionally not come to your park that day. Let's meet, and I'll tell you everything. Agatha agreed, and that same day Bernard took her to his family. He showed her his new passport. He showed it to everyone now. He was proud to have a document. They talked, and Agatha confessed that she missed him, but was afraid of seeming intrusive and easily accessible. So she left a guest across the street. At home, Bernard introduced her to everyone. She was received warmly and cordially, and Agatha, over dinner, confessed that she was no gypsy. She was just an acting student. That was her assignment, to pretend to be a fortune teller. But she met Bernard, and she got carried away, and she didn't want to part with him or the image. And it was scary to say that she had lied to him about everything from the beginning. What if he hadn't forgiven her? Was any of it true? Bernard asked, not letting go of her hand. Her revelation was shocking, but his whole life lately didn't fit into the concept. Ordinary either. So much had happened that a little lie he could easily understand and forgive. We're all human. He had lied a thousand times himself, and he felt no guilt. And a stranger didn't have to tell the whole truth about herself. But now, after getting to know him better, she was showing her cards. Isn't that a sign that she cares about Bernard? Yes. I wasn't lying when I said my grandmother was a gypsy. Only she's alive. And so is my father, and so is my father, and so is my mother. All of them. But there's something of a gypsy in me. So you're not Agatha? Bernard asked. The girl shook her head. So what's your name? Ariel. She smiled. Bernard and Ariel, Ariel and Bernard. Little Chad babbled on and on, and everyone at the table laughed, embarrassing both the guest and Bernard himself. Lily was very warm to the girl. They talked for a long time about the recipes, about all his studies, about the recipes at the Theatre Institute, about the future. They all had a lot to say to each other. They had just met. Each of them was a bit of a stranger here, but happy to be at this table. Sergei was the most embarrassed, but he coped, showing with all his appearance how grateful he was to Lily. She had rescued him from the nursing home and taken him in. She took him to the bathroom and helped him change. He never imagined that, after all these years, they would be with her. Charles' sons took the news that their father was going to live with a stranger negatively. Their mother died less than a year ago, and they believed that his father betrayed her memory by his action. But there was no way out. He did not want to go to the old house. And his feelings for Lelia were real. He had carried them through life, and now that she herself had called him to her place, he simply could not refuse. He understood that fate was giving him the very last chance to be with his beloved. The first time he dared not snatch her from home, then from the convent. He put his sense of duty above his own feelings and stayed with the unloved one. And 
Afterward, when he learned of the death of the son he had dreamed all his life of meeting, he sobbed like a baby for many days, refusing to eat, drink, or leave his room. A couple of months after that, Charles buried his wife. She knew about his son on the side and knew he was dead, but she showed no emotion. Maybe underlying resentment and anger ruined her health so early. She was a hard person, never a smile. Never a smile, never praise. Only criticism and rebuke. Only once did she say to his face, I feel this way about you, Charles, because it's hard to be an unloved wife. I know you love her all your life, and I've seen the picture you keep under your mattress too. So don't demand love from me if you can't give it to me yourself. Charles sighed. He wasn't going to deny it. Yes, it had happened, but he fulfilled his role as her husband until the very last day. She died in his arms, so Charles and Lily were given an incredible second chance by fate. They decided they wanted it to be real, and they got officially married. All the sons came to the wedding, even though they harbored resentment toward their father. But a father is a father. It's his choice, and the sons had to accept it. And Bernard got an apartment as an orphan. He and Ariel moved in, quietly got married in the registry office, and adopted Chad. He went to school in the new neighborhood. Bernard visited his mom and dad every day without exception. Lily rejoiced. She was all alone until she was 35 in a monastery, and every day she begged God for a large, friendly family. She begged. Bernard took a job at a firm where he was trained to drive and was issued a license. He knew this town like the back of his hand, so he had no trouble delivering important papers and driving large of the bosses on their cases. The salary was very good, a full social package. Charles took care of all this. It was a small derial of what he could do for his own son, and he was glad to help in any way he could. Charles was put on his feet by Lily, and he helped her with her eye operation and nursed her while she wore the bandage. They made small repairs to the house and began walking together. They walked all over town. Often Bernard joined them. Ariel understood his attachment to his parents and she always treated it normally. No jealousy or recriminations. Lily, on the other hand, began to see well, began to knit and read again. She had loved these activities before, but her eyesight had gone and she had to give them all up. Now she was happy, as was her tramp son. Bernard and Ariel were expecting their firstborn. The ultrasound showed a girl. For Bernard, there was only one mystery in the whole story. How could Ariel predict his future so accurately? She had spoken at random. The girl admitted that she improvised and said the first thing that came into her head. That often coincided with reality. She said good things to people, tried to make only good predictions, because it was just an acting assignment, which she liked. Maybe it was the psychology classes she had taken at the Institute. Or maybe it was her gypsy roots, 